Good morning. I'd like to take the minute to welcome you to today's service and to say thank you for joining us. Whether you're from Perfala, Ontario, or the world, we want to bless you and hope that your eyes will turn to our glorious Lord and Savior and to hear and to sense something that you have never sensed or felt before, that his word is an amazing word and it is the right word for you and I today. Today's scripture reading, it will be taken from Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 6 to 8. It says, Therefore, be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that had, has God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us? For whatever reason we may call upon him, and what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law? And that's the word for Torah, which I set before you uh, this day. God's word is wonderful in every way. And our title this morning of our text is, Has the Bible Become a Strange Thing? That is our title. And shortly, I'll be reading some scriptures and our text, Shall We Pray? Father, we thank you for this wonderful day. We thank you for your goodness and mercy to us. We ask, Lord, that you would guide us and lead us because your lamp, you say, is a light unto our path and a light for our way. And so we pray, Lord, that you would guide us and lead us right to the throne of heaven itself where we can learn more from you and where our minds can be refreshed and our hearts uh, instilled with the wonderful truths from your word. We just pray now for a blessing, and we ask for your help today, in Jesus' name, amen. First Chronicles 28, 8 says, And so now I charge you in the sight of all Israel, and of the assembly of the Lord, and in the hearing of our God, be careful to follow all the commands of the Lord your God, that you may possess this good land, and pass it on as an inheritance to your descendants forever. Ezekiel chapter 20 verse 11 says, And I gave them my statutes and showed them my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. And Psalm 119, 103 says, Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. And Psalm 119, 103 says, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. This now is our text taken from the book of Hosea, chapter 8, verse 12. And this is our text today. I have written for him the great things of my law, but they were considered a strange thing. A strange thing. In a study done a while ago by George Barna, he wrote about the flagging biblical illiteracy in North America. It was of great concern when, when he discovered that 60% of Americans cannot even name five of the Ten Commandments. 82% of Americans believe God helps those who help themselves is actually a Bible verse. 12% of adults that he consulted believe that Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. He went on and discovered that more than 50% of graduating high school students thought that Sodom and Gomorrah were husband and wife. And a large number of respondents to one survey indicated that the Sermon on the Mount was actually preached by Billy Graham. In a 2010 study of the religious environment in the U.S., the Barna Group noted that while most people regard Easter as a religious holiday, a minority of adults associate Easter with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. George Gallup, another pollster in the book The People's Religion, observed that Americans have become a nation of biblical illiterates. They found fewer than half of all adults can name can only name maybe four of the Gospels if best, and many professing Christians cannot identify more than two or three of the twelve disciples. How many churches are actually dying on the vine or sliding into a wholesale apostasy because their members can't discern 
between truth and error. Our standards of morality can get skewed when good is evil and evil becomes good, and when God's word becomes a strange thing. My title is a challenging question, and it was uh, a great thought and prayer when I came up with this title, and I believe it's the Lord's title. Has the Bible become a strange thing? I wrote for him a great deal of my Torah, my way, my lifestyle, my law, and yet they reckoned or accounted it all as alien. And I write out my revelation for them in detail, and they pretend they can't read it. And that's Hosea 8.12 in the message version. In the Orthodox Jewish Bible, it says, I have written to him the many things of my Torah, but they were regarded as a zor. And the zor means a strange thing or something that you turn aside from. I have been asking myself this question all week long. How could God's word become a strange thing? How did they lose their way? As special people, God called them with a glorious future laid out for them. And in Deuteronomy 26, 18, God uses that term, a special people. Simply this, they followed the world, conformed to unholy standards, and lost their way. This is a huge tragedy and a sad departure from what God intended. But the Lord said through the law and the prophets, the great things God's word is and does for us. In Revelation 15, 3, it says, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. And one of his great and marvelous works is his abiding word, for it abides forever. His word is a lamp, the Bible says. It's a lamp illuminating everything in its path, enlightening the mind, the soul, the heart of anyone who will take time with it. His word is sweet. His word is inspired. His word is profitable and good. His word is living and active. His word is sharp like a two-edged sword, dividing the soul and spirit. And we are encouraged to live on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, as Jesus himself said. Hosea 8.12 is extremely sad, brethren, when God states that the Torah, or his holy word, was written as a mentor, a teacher, a trainer, a coach for his beloved people. Israel ignored it and fluffed it off. And it's stating that Israel rejected the best possible advice. But the verse goes on to draw the picture even worse. Notice that the verb reckoned, or, or uh, as is in reckoned, to be something foreign or alien or a strange thing. This is the opposite of how we're supposed to see this verb. It is the same verb actually used as in Genesis 15, when God reckoned or accounted or credited Abraham's faith to be the same as righteousness. God reckoned or credited Abraham's faith to be one of such value that he himself regarded it as righteousness. A righteousness that neither Abraham nor you and I can claim on our own. Now, think about our text in verse 12. Israel credited or reckoned God's Torah, God's word, of being of such little value that it seemed like foreign refuse, something unclean, something akin to rubbish. First, the word of God became a strange thing because they ignored and forgot its author. So, let's talk about its author. The Enlightenment was a huge experiment that took us away from the study of theology. During the Middle Ages, the theology was actually heralded as the queen of the sciences. But the Enlightenment came in, and people left theology behind for other things. Alexander Pope, writing in this topsy-turvy time of the Enlightenment, said that the proper study of mankind is man, in his work called An Essay on Man. On its publication, Voltaire called the essay the most beautiful, the most useful, the most sublime poem ever written in any language. Immanuel Kant defined the Enlightenment as the progress of mankind toward improvement. And during the Enlightenment, Voltaire used the term gens 
de letters, or men of letters, describing who he said were men who were super scholars, who were living like living encyclopedias, who mastered the arts, mastered the sciences, and above all literature to arrive at a new utopia. I wish, friends, that they had mastered God's holy word, for we live in the consequences and shadow of the enlightenment still even today. The greatest study of all is theology, for it's the study of God. This is the crown of science. To apply one's mind to it is the greatest study, which can ever hold our attention or curious curiosity. It's the master study of the name, the work, the person, the nature, the wonder, and the existence of our Heavenly Father, hallowed be his name, as Jesus said in his high, his wonderful prayer. There is nothing so calming to the mind as a serious contemplation of the Holy One. It is such an amazing subject. Pride is sunk in its everlasting infinity. Many subjects we can actually grasp and we can feel self-contented and, and go along our merry way with thoughts. I am doing really good. And look at the stuff I've mastered like King Nebuchadnezzar. We can get programs like QuickBooks and do a great job on our own taxes. And we can even Google search many topics and have instant answers all at the touch of a button, all at the command, at our command on our terms. Friends, when we come to this superb science, we discover that our tape measure runs out of tape. We will say with Job, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Or the psalmist, when he declared, what is man that he is mindful of him in Psalm 8, 4. No subject of contemplation will humble you and bring you to your knees than thoughts of the glory of God, the wisdom of God, the life of God, and the love of God. These are the unsearchable riches that Paul talks about in Ephesians 3, 8. No study this side of heaven can thrill the soul and inspire our hearts as only God and his word can. He or she who actually contemplates the living God will have a better mind than those who find fault with it, disregard it, ignore it, mock it, or blaspheme it. Nothing will so thrill the intellect or magnify the soul as a serious investigation of the special subject of the Holy One, whom we refer to here as our Heavenly Father, the only begotten Son, and the blessed Holy Spirit. And I'm referring here to the Holy Trinity. With this subject, there was a balm of Gilead for every ache in the soul. So I urge everyone today, even watching this, plunge yourself into the study of theology. Be lost in his wonderful immensity. And you will experience what the psalmist did when he said, he restores my soul in Psalm 23. I do not know of anything in all the world which can comfort the soul, cool the heat of the battle, calm the splashing waves of anxiety and despair, delight and refresh our anxious souls in times of turmoil as a wonderful musing on the subject of God. If you were to study in the greatest libraries of the entire world, this one study alone will light more fire in your soul put zeal in your passion and ignite the life of the mind as nothing can. For God is the everlasting author of his word. He is the Al Olam, the everlasting God, without beginning and without end. He is the author and perfecter of our most holy faith. With theology comes the mighty doctrine of the immutability of God, which says, I am God and I change not, according to Malachi 3.6. The Lord God Almighty doesn't change in regards to his essence. And since that is true, his word doesn't flip-flop and change either with every whim of mankind. Just look up Ephesians 4, 14 for that. All creatures change. Men and women the world over change. And we're always undergoing alteration. But his word doesn't. That's the key. He remains everlastingly the same. And so does his awesome word. Brethren, he was the mighty God when he spoke the world out of deep darkness into marvelous light. And he was the omnipotent one when he said, let there be, and there was. 
He himself says, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, measured heaven with a span, and calculated the dust of the earth in a balance, weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. He piled the mountains and scooped out the hollow places for the rolling deep. He asked Job these penetrating questions in Job 39. Have you given the horse strength? Does the hawk fly by your wisdom? Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you must know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. He is unchanging in his power. Israel should have known this one too, friends. He was the mighty God then, powerful as ever, and in his and his mighty arm isn't failing now. He is the same colossal one, traveling in the greatness of his strength, traveling in this holy might, an amazing cap capability. Just look up Isaiah 61, uh, 1 to 3. His energy isn't drooping and his desire isn't waning with time either. He was wise when he laid the foundation of the earth. He had infinite wisdom when he planned the way of our salvation and in eternity past marked out the mystery of his will, Ephesians 1.9. So his word was compiled with the greatest wisdom and it is ever the mighty word of God for it is as its author, its heavenly author, a sovereign one who is unlimited and boundless in every conceivable way. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary, nor are his understanding, his understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Yes, for the grass withers, the flower fades because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Isaiah 40 says his word stands forever. And so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please. And it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Isaiah 55. His word is never able to come back void, which is the Hebrew word rakam, which means without cause, empty or vain or void. For his mighty author says, it will accomplish what I please. Yes, he, he is wise now and he hasn't lost any ability. He is unchanged in his mighty wisdom. He is not deficient in any way. From everlasting to everlasting, the psalmist says, he is God. He knows as much now as ever. He is the same with the same incredible skill and the same infinite knowledge. He is unchanged, blessed be his name in his justice. And Israel should have known this. He is just and holy as he always was in the past and just and holy he is right now. In fact, the Bible says that forever he is holy, holy, holy the Lord God Almighty. He is unchanged in his truth. Israel should have known this one. What he has promised, he does bring to pass. When he declares it is finished, it is complete. And even Jesus said that from the cross. Sir Spurgeon said, the promise of God is as good as the performance itself. God doesn't change in regards to his plans. Has it ever been said that God began to build something and wasn't able to finish it? Even the storehouse of snow is at his command, Job 38. His own right hand created worlds as numerous as drops of the morning dew. God never fails, never. And please look up Joshua 21:45. There can be a run on the banks, but there never can be a run on God's promises. For what he has promised will always come true. The living God spoke worlds into being. The heavens and the earth were mere utterances from his lips. If he parted the Red Sea, he did so. And the untold wonders he did in their midst was amazing. So this is a very strange thing indeed, that his people, called by his name, his chosen people, counted the author of Holy Scripture as a strange thing. 
Second, the word of God became a strange thing because they ignored and forgot the word of God. Now let's talk about his word. They abandoned his word. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of, of earth purified seven times, Psalm 12 says. Here the psalmist complains that the godly man ceaseth, the faithful fail from among the children of men. Hear me here, please. If men and women fail and falter, brethren, the mighty word of the Lord doesn't it and abides forever. We are encouraged to live in communion with his word and its author. Even in the absence of friends, you will not lack good, wholesome company. The truly blessed person feeds on the word of God. And look up Psalm 1 and Psalm 119 for that. The psalmist turned away from the voice of the boaster to the words of the Lord. He held to the promise, the precepts, and the pure truth, and it encouraged his drooping heart. It consoled him greatly when others fell away like dead flies in the perfumer's ointment. He didn't have what we have today, but what he had he used for God's glory. And he mused, and he thought, and he prayed over the bits that he had, and he prized the word of God above the finest gold in the entire land. The voices of earth are full of falsehood and under the sway, please hear me, under the sway of the evil one. But the word from heaven is pure, 1 John 5.19. Here is a good lesson for us today. Make the word of God your daily companion, for his words can sustain you always, Isaiah 46. Every word of God is pure and full of soul nourishment, restoring the soul. Psalm 23 again. Jesus himself said that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Though the words of the Lord are pure words, it is a book that's pure in the sense of truth and without error. This is what many people's problems are in high profile ministries across Canada and the US. They're falling into horrible, gross sin. Brethren, the Bible is inspired and inerrant. Mark this one in the Bible leaf of your Bible and please never veer from it. If I am to judge and fault it, then it will become no judge of me. If I am to husk it like corn husks and toss them aside and lay this aside and that aside and, and just accept what I like, disregard what I don't like, then I have no guidance whatever because I've been led away by my own heart. Brethren, I will risk my soul with this guide inspired from heaven. Then with all the nincompoops who arise from quarters of learning and spew false things about God's holy word, whether they call it progressive or wokeism or anything else they hold up as new and modern with the wisdom or thought. Friends, it is balderdash. Please, it is balderdash against God's holy word. The word of God has stood for ages, stood the blasphemies and horrible accusations man has thrown at it, and yet it stands still. The anvil of God's word. Last eve I paused beside the blacksmith's door and heard the anvil ring the vesper chime. Ding! Ding! Then looking in, I saw upon the floor old hammers worn with beating years of time. How many anvils have you had, said I, to wear and batter all these hammers so? Just one, said he. And then, with twinkling eye, the anvil wears the hammers out, you know. And so I thought, the anvil of God's word, for ages skeptics' blows have beat upon. Yet though the noise of falling blows was heard, the anvil is unharmed. The hammers all gone. If the devil could have destroyed the Bible, he would have done it already. But he can't. He can't destroy the Bible. Brethren, he hasn't been able to destroy one jot or tittle in all of God's holy word. He that spoke these words was infallible, and therefore they are infallible. Has he ever made a mistake? Could he err and still be God? Has he said that he should not do it in Numbers 23? 19? Or has he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Numbers 23, 19. Be sure of this. 
The Holy Spirit uses the word of God, and this is his one battering ram, which he uses to bring down strongholds of sin and pride in human hearts. And Israel counted it all as a strange thing. Conclusion. Why did it become a strange thing? Because they disregarded his holy word and it was put on a shelf. They became ignorant of its mighty teaching, became blind to its truth, became swayed by the culture. They became futile in their thoughts and professing to become wise. They actually became fools, Romans 1, And so the prophet says in his time and ours, who has believed our report? What a disheartening thing to know that not everyone will accept Christ or his word. It stands as a warning for all of us that faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word of Christ. And all day long, he stretches out his hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Romans 10, 21. We must keep our hearts soft and pliable before the Lord. Let his word constantly penetrate and germinate your hearts for God yielding fruit. Hold and grasp the word of God. Take in God's word. Eat them and feast on them. Like the prophet Jeremiah who said, your words were found and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. Jeremiah 15, 16. He is faithful even when we are not. Everything we do has consequences. The sins that we do has consequences. The good things that we do have consequences and the priorities in life have consequences. The psalmist said, blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly nor stand in the way of sinners, but nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law does he meditate day and night. And he or she shall be a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season. His leaf shall not wither and whatever he does shall prosper. The word of God is tried and proved, and the word of God is a guide in chaos and perplexity. The word of God is a far better oracle than the oracle of Delphi. For his word is a lamp unto my feet, guiding in moral and spiritual perplexity. Because we have the Old and New Testaments, friend, in its completion, please hear me, we have the Old and New Testament in completion. So we should take 10 times more delight in it than the psalmist even did. And so why should Christians delight in God's word? Because it's God's law. That's right. Anything belonging to God should delight us and thrill us. We delight in it because it comes with divine authority. We prize the book because of its incredible wisdom. And there is more wisdom here than anything else. Here is the word of God, and here we learn of his love for us in the person of Jesus Christ. And this is the great and grandest wisdom that our crucified Redeemer died in our place, the just for the unjust, 1 Peter 3.18. We should delight in God's word because it's true. It is of infinite value because every word stands like granite and encourages us to heaven's glory. And the Christian if you're called a Christian today, stand up and hear this. We should delight in the law of the Lord because it's profitable. It enriches us, sustains us, corrects us, and convicts us. Praise God. So I want earnestly to ask us each here today, do you delight in the book? Do you delight in God's book? Not do you read it, but do you delight in it? Do you know? To go there dragged by duty is miserably to miss the best messages and it's no evidence of true godliness. To grow healthy on it, you know, is one of the truest tests of being a blessed man or a blessed woman. And I grieve, friends, I do, I grieve that there are some who bear the Christian name that Holy Scripture is the least read book in all of their library. We shouldn't treat the eternal God with disrespect like Israel did. And we should delight in his word. Do you read it? Do you read it? Then believe it. Yes, we can have our lives go out of control, fail to reach our potential, or be derailed by the influence of others. Or we can receive God's word, 
his coaching, his counsel, his instruction, and his mentoring, and find full potential with God's help. Well, Israel made the wrong choice. What is yours today? What is your choice today? I hope the word of God does not become a strange thing or has become a strange thing to you, friend. Treasure his word. Please hear me here. Make all men and women know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life eternal with him. And go keep it a secret. Don't hide it under a bushel. Let everyone know. And go into all the world and preach this glorious gospel to everyone. And may God bless you. And let it be a light, God's word. Let it be a light unto your path and a light unto your way. And I pray that it will never become a strange thing to us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I ask that in Jesus' name, this is a stirring scripture. It's almost haunting in its power. Has the Bible, the law of God, become a strange thing? Oh, Father, I pray it will not. I pray you will use this message for your glory and for your honor. I pray that you will stimulate and motivate people by the ton and, and bring them in and show them the wonderful things from your word. I pray their hearts and minds and souls would become restored and rejuvenated and excited and thrilled about the living God and about your word, oh God, that it will not be a strange thing. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. And I'll see you next Sunday.